Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your hurricane outlook and discussion. Notice, I didn't say off-season. It's time. It's time to do these practically every day. They won't be every single day. I would love to be able to do that, but sometimes I will have to travel, as is the case this week, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. I'll talk about that later. Um, and then during the hurricane season, there'll be times when there's just nothing to talk about to speak of, and we'll take a few days off. But the rest of the season for the next uh, 190 days or so, something like that, uh, these will be pretty much every day. All right, And sometimes, several times per day. Uh, it is May the 20th, 2019, and this is the all-new Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. If this is your first time watching me, Howdy, welcome, hello. Um, got the new graphic down here, just updated it a little bit and uh, put my email address on there if anybody ever needs to email me with suggestions or ideas or whatever, uh, you can do that. We still use email, right? Uh, comments on YouTube and elsewhere, but we still use email. All right, I need to shut it and move on, get rid of my image for a minute. We have a lot to talk about. First, let's start off with March the 9th. Why are we going back in time? I want to show you this. This is the subsurface uh, anomaly chart from March the 9th, and you can see this is when we really thought that the El Nino was coming on strong, maybe going to be like 2015, and you know do all kinds of things when you warm up the Pacific like that, the equatorial region. Uh, it can become a big problem for global weather patterns, and have a big impact on the Atlantic hurricane season. Then we fast forward to just the other day, May 13th. Hey, what happened? It uh, <laughs> A lot of that upper ocean heat content went away and definitely dwindling. And in the eastern part of the Pacific over here, uh, very cold anomalies. These represent departures from normal. And this is several degrees Celsius below normal in the eastern Pacific. And it's basically basin-wide in the subsurface there, uh, below about 110 meters or so, uh, a good chunk of it anyway, that we're talking about uh, about a degree Celsius below the long-term average. So we went from, you know, uh, another possibly strong El Nino event looking fairly likely to, yeah, whatever we got out there. And again, let me just say this, bring me back on just for a second. The Climate Prediction Center, uh, part of the U.S. Department of Commerce, the NOAA people, CPC Climate Prediction Center, they are saying that we are in an El Nino through their classification system, whereas the folks in Australia at the Bureau of Meteorology, not so much. They have different ways of classifying it. We won't get into that today. Uh, but that kind of goes to show you, too, that, well, it must not be that worthy of an El Nino if there is some debate, so to speak, between the United States and the Australians. So just want to throw that out there. And when you look at this anomaly chart here, the subsurface anomalies, you can tell there's just not much ammunition here for an El Nino to keep going, to flourish, etc. Uh, I just don't see it happening. So there you go. And if we look at it, and let's get rid of some of these tabs, uh, on the surface, this updated on the 16th. I was waiting for the one to update today, but perhaps with all that's going on with the stuff over here in the nation's midsection today, we'll talk about that. Uh, things just aren't updating the way they should. I waited and waited, and the server kept showing the 16th. But whatever, it hasn't changed that dramatically since the 16th, which is what we have here, updated on the 16th a few days ago. Notice. In the Atlantic, tropical Atlantic, plus sign here because it is warmer than average overall. And in the Pacific, uh, a little bit warmer than average, but you see these little areas of cool showing up. And that's going to really start to matter because those chinks in the armor, so to speak, of the, um, of the El Nino dragon to, you know, quote, well... <laughs> The Game of Thrones phenomenon, and I was thinking more of Lord of the Rings, right? The, the, at least with the Hobbit, that first dragon, Smaug. And, you know, that's a good analogy, right? The dragons breathe fire, typically in, in, um, in legend and, and myth. 
Uh, and these El Ninos are warm events. And so I'm trying to work with that analogy there that, yes, these are these little holes in the armor of the El Nino dragon, so to speak, and they will get larger and will help to bring down said dragon. All right, so there you go. That's the, the extent of my uh, dragon analogy for today. But it, it's true. The, uh, the El Nino that we have in place according to CPC should be weakening. I think it is weakening. We can all see that on a lot of different uh, measures. And I don't think it's going to have much of a chance to come back. That, coupled with the warmer Atlantic over here, uh, overall, especially compared to where we were last year at this time, where it was just a huge blue area all through here, uh, very, very cold relative to average. We'll see, though. It's only mid-May, and, you know, in two months, things can change. But I, I think we're going to enter the season with fairly favorable conditions for hurricanes to develop. All right, uh, so one of the ways we look at this, I just wanted to show you some of this graphically. This is from Levi Cowan's website, tropicaltidbits.com. And this is one of the methodologies used, the CDAS, uh, CDAS, Atlantic Main Development Region Anomaly. And the main thing I wanted to show you is the latest value here is on the positive side. You can see that both graphically represented. It's been going up since the beginning of the month. And we now have a value of not quite a tenth of a degree Celsius above the long-term average, but it certainly isn't like this, where it was below average, or even recently, right at the very beginning of May, it was still below average by about two tenths of a degree. Now it's come up, and that is significant because it's now anomalously warm, according to this data set, as well as the NOAA NESDIS data set, which is over here. And you can see that. This is more of a, a map representation of that region, right? So that's really important to note as we go forward, okay? Also, the same gets applied to the Nino 3.4 index. What is that, you may ask? Well, out here, uh, I think it's about 120 longitude to... 150 or so, somewhere out here is roughly the Nino 3.4 area. It's divided into regions, kind of like a Venn diagram. Bottom line is when we look at the Nino index, uh, that has come down, and its value is technically below the NOAA threshold. The CPC, Climate Prediction Center, usually looks at a 0.5 or higher as being an El Nino. We're sitting at, you know, We'll just call it 0.39. So you can even round it up if you want to be a little bit liberal with it and call it 0.4. Yeah, round it to the nearest tenth. Uh, so there you go. Whole number anyway, 0.4. What is the Nino uh, 1.2 area? That's down. That's below average at almost a tenth of a degree. And that represents roughly this area right through here. Um, I'll pull up one of those charts one day just to remind you, but... I'm spending a lot of time on this because this is going to be a very big player for the Atlantic hurricane season as well. It should be because when the Pacific out here is warmer than average, generally speaking, you have rising motion and stronger winds that come across the tropical Atlantic, not quite out to Africa and not in the subtropics or the Gulf of Mexico. It's usually... This area right through here, Caribbean into the tropical Atlantic, uh, fast-moving westerly winds. Let's get me a red color in here. Fast-moving westerly winds. That air is also sinking through here generally. It's just very unpleasant for tropical storms to try to develop in that environment, put it that way. So there you go. We have the NOAA hurricane forecast coming out soon and other updates from people. And I suspect we will be looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll be looking at a average to above average season ahead. Last week I mentioned a pretty good rant about sports analogy. I'll try to sort of do it again without it being long. Bring me back on for a second. The way I look at it is kind of like having a, f uh, a favorable team, okay, in, in pro sports or amateur sports, whatever. You've got very good players. And the potential is there for your team to do very well. 
Uh, and in this case, though, if the Atlantic does very well, we could have a lot of problems. And you know, I don't want to uh, make light of this at all, but that's the analogy to look at because there's always that X factor. You know, you can go look at Duke basketball. I'm a big basketball fan. You can see the Duke logo back there. You know, Zion Williamson hurt his foot there uh, during that Carolina game, and he was out for several weeks. And that was the X factor. You know, had that not happened, they might have gone and won the national championship because they would have had more experience, more cohesion, etc. Right? And so you can apply that to the Atlantic and, and even the Pacific, depending on what basin you're looking at. If the conditions are there, it doesn't equal or mean that it has to be busy, just like when Zion Williamson came to Duke. That didn't guarantee a national championship. Hey, they won the ACC championship. That was pretty good. Um, but it, it's just a, uh, a favorable setup, put it that way. All right, so let's move along. Uh, we have all this in place, and this is a good segue to this segment. Look, we already have a couple of areas of interest here. Invest area 91E and an invest area 90L. What does that mean, you may ask, especially if you're new? These are, first of all, right where they should be for this time of year, in the Western Hemisphere, right off the coast of Central America, and in the Southwest Atlantic, a typical area for development. Um, it's just a short way of these little eyes and an invest. It's an area of investigation. It's the first step that the, the National Hurricane Center and other agencies take in investigating a system further hey, it might have some potential. And so they have an, uh, a numbering system or a labeling system is a better way to say it. And we used uh, 90 through 99 as the numbers and the letter L for Atlantic. Actually, it's AL. And then E or EP for Eastern Pacific, right? So that's how that works. So this is Eastern Pacific Invest Area 91. This has already been a 90 recently, I believe. And in the Atlantic, we're at 90 L. So here we go. All right. Uh, so let's see. Look at the National Hurricane Center, red X in the Southwest Atlantic. And we're going to come back to this in just a second. Whoops. By the way, the Central Pacific now, I believe, is part of the uh, National Hurricane Center area of responsibility. If I am not mistaken, they merged. Um, so we'll have Central Pacific, Eastern North Pacific. If it'll load, come on. I, I'm just telling you, I think the servers overall uh, across NOAA are just boggy today, bogged down because of that big high risk in the plains. It's like a Cat 5 hurricane coming for the Gulf or the Atlantic. I can't get this to pull. There it is. All righty. Thank you, server. Uh, low chance of development here uh, off the southwest coast of Central America, southeastern Pacific. So we'll monitor this. I'll show you what I think is going to happen. I believe we're going to see some development somewhere in this area over the next week. It's just going to take a little bit of time. So back to our Atlantic system. This is Invest Area 90L. This is what it looks like on a satellite graphical tropical weather outlook overlay. And real quick to read it to you, uh, showers and thunderstorms have you know associated with a broad area of low pressure. Located several hundred miles southwest of Bermuda are showing signs of organization. Although recent satellite wind data suggests that this system currently lacks a well-defined center of circulation, environmental conditions are expected to be conducive for the formation of a short-lived subtropical or tropical cyclone. Conditions of forecast become unfavorable after that, so forth and so on. Interest in Bermuda should monitor the progress of this system. Bermuda is right there. So what does all of that mean? Well... A subtropical storm has the winds less concentrated about its center. It's kind of a hybrid between a mid-latitude storm and a tropical storm, kind of a mutt, if you will, uh, and it's not quite as concentrated around the center. You don't have as well a defined core or a tight wind gradient is typically the way I look at a subtropical storm, whereas a tropical storm is more of your classic banding feature with the winds closer to the center a, uh, a more classic look is the way to think of it. The subtropical storm is kind of like your, you know, your, your not-so-classical way. And, and they both have generally the same effects, though. A subtropical storm can bring plenty of rain, 
uh, storm surge, wind, you know, whatever. So um, it's just a labeling thing, all right? That's about the best way to look at it. So how does it look? Here's this latest satellite picture. I was drawing on it. Let's get rid of that. Come on, go away. Do do do. There we go. Uh, really nice high resolution satellite imagery from the GOES 16 system. And here's our system of interest. If it'll stop doing that to me, right in here. And uh, Recon investigating it. A few glitches in the satellite frames there, but that's the area. Uh, water temperatures in this part of the Atlantic, you know, marginally conducive, 25, 26 Celsius in this area. Favorable upper level winds. You can see a little bit of outflow in there. Uh, you know, it's it's May. You're not going to get anything strong, thank goodness. Those come later. Um, but there it is. And, you know, if you're worried about this in Bermuda, don't be. I'll show you why in just a moment. Let me go back over here to the... Uh, University of Wisconsin site. I want to show you if I click on this. It's been a while since I've dug this up. 850 millibar vorticity. This shows me the structure of the system. And let's go back to using uh, what should we use? Let's use purple. There it is right there. And you see it's fairly round in its structure as is 91E down here in the southeastern Pacific. This is kind of like an x-ray. It's not but that's how I liken it. It's not an x-ray, but that's how I think of it. It's a way to see through the clouds and you get an idea of the structure. This is a giant ocean storm. This is all the energy associated with that high risk and it's spin in the atmosphere, energy, vorticity. And there's a whole math and physics side to it that I didn't study because I am a physical geographer not a degreed meteorologist. Someone else can tell you the differential equations and the math and physics involved. I look at it from a different perspective, and that is, what does it show me? Okay, so I'm kind of like a PA versus a full-on 12-year uh, degreed doctor. Does that make sense? Hope so. Uh, or, or a technician. I can read the chart, but I couldn't tell you the advanced uh, mechanisms behind it because that's not what I specialize in. I specialize in impact and awareness and so forth and the, the birth of these systems, picking them out. And I try to help you uh, understand along the same way. So just explaining that a little bit. So there you go. Fairly well organized, circular in its structure. See how this vorticity is all stretched out. Still energy in the atmosphere, but it's not concentrated. Whereas this system in the southwest Atlantic and this other one down in the southeastern Pacific is trying to become more concentrated. So we'll keep an eye on this. Again, if you're in Bermuda, um, I don't think this is going to be, be a big problem. I'm going to skip over here to the GFS, and I will show you why. First of all, that's the vorticity signature in the GFS model, the global forecast system. So watch as I put this into motion. This is over the next several days. Uh, the feature moves up, gets a little bit better organized. We'll speed this up a little bit. I hope so. There we go. And moves on out. Another upper level low moves in. I think this goes out to about 10 days. So I'm going to stop it. And let's see, where'd my pointer go? This thing's trying to be funny. We'll go to first, then we'll move ahead. So right there. It gets a little bit better organized. That's about 24 hours right there. There's Bermuda over here. All the energy to the southwest over time. The structure of it improves just a little bit. We keep moving through these frames. And it passes close to Bermuda as it starts to fade out. You see that? That's about 48 hours out or so. There's Bermuda right in there. So maybe some rain, which is good. Fresh water fills up the cisterns and so forth. Meanwhile, uh, you notice too, let's put this back into motion if it'll let me. You notice that southeast ridge right here. That's that huge ridge of high pressure sitting over the southeastern United States today. This is the energy over the Great Plains, that deep southerly flow. Everything seems to be connected. It's just amazing. You get an anomalous ridging, hot weather, over the nation's eastern part, right? And then you've got this trough and energy coming in on that boundary over here. We'll stop at about right there. Yeah, see, there's the outline of the ridge. 
There's the severe weather taking shape in the plains, our tropical system, subtropical, whatever, trying to develop there. Woo! Very complex. Uh, let me put this into motion and scroll down because look at this in the eastern Pacific. I do think we're going to get something to try to develop, maybe even at the end of the 10 days, something in the western Caribbean. Bottom line, it's almost hurricane season and energy, vorticity in the atmosphere starting to gather. You got this sort of favorable Central American gyre trying to show up down here. This is more of a baroclinic system, uh, the feature that we're watching today, not directly related to this energy down here in Central America. It's all complicated, but for you, on your end of the screen, it says hurricane season is approaching, time to get ready and pay attention. No worries. None of this means necessarily, oh, we're going to have a terrible season and all that doom and gloom stuff. I'll tell you when it's time to worry, and this is not that time. Real quick, TAF-B, Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch. Now, this is interesting. The first Atlantic easterly wave of hurricane season, now, you know, still a couple weeks away, uh, analyzed on their unified surface analysis. Let's zoom in and take a look at that. Where is it? View the image. Click on it right there. Where? Right off the coast of Africa. Interesting. We were talking about that in recent updates that the West African monsoon, very energized for this time of year. There's the monsoon trough, tropical wave embedded in that. These move across about 100, 110 of these a year. And maybe six to 10 of them will develop. We'll see. Monsoon trough set up here over the eastern Pacific into Central America and parts of Northwest South America. Our low pressure area north of the Bahamas and the Greater Antilles, etc. Yeah, it's getting busy. Hard to believe it's already back again. Almost. All right, so we've already looked at this. Now, real quick, not much I can say about what's happening in the Great Plains. A massive, historic, Cat 5 hurricane type day. This is like Michael coming, you know, or Andrew or whatever. Big, big, big problems. There are a whole bunch of experts that already know what to say and do about this. If a high risk doesn't get your attention, I don't know what will. I'm just showing you the obvious. Now, I do want to point this out because while the greatest threat uh, is, you know, what happened to Come on, where did it go? There we go. While well, the greatest threat is certainly and rightfully so here, and that's where hundreds, if not thousands, of storm chasers are gathered, which is the recipe for disaster if they're not careful. That's all I'll say about that. Uh, this shouldn't be ignored either. Uh, New England, slight risk of severe weather, general thunderstorms down the rest of the eastern seaboard and parts of the Florida Peninsula, as well as out here in the Rockies and beyond. But without a doubt, this is a really big deal right here, and uh, I hope people are careful. It's going to be fascinating to watch with the high-res satellite animation that we do have now with the GO-16 data, and there are several research groups out there using a lot of different methodologies. Um, it's still, I've talked about it before, if I was going to go out there, I would have put about a half a dozen of my hurricane cameras across this area right through here in a fence, if you will, somewhere inside the eastern boundary of that high-risk area and just see what we get. The budget wasn't there, travel plans, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, it just wasn't the time to do it. Hopefully, if we get another one of these big days, a moderate or a high risk, and preferably a little bit more to the north, maybe up here, uh, in early June, a moderate or high risk, even an enhanced day, I plan on doing it. I think the, the money will be in place, and it could be really fascinating to try something different. We'll talk about that later. All right, um, real quick, bring me back up just for a second. So a lot of things happening as I segue out of the discussion part and sort of talk about housekeeping stuff, whatever, business, other activities. Uh, Wednesday I'll be traveling to Toronto up in Canada, uh, in Ontario, and... Um, uh, going to Discovery Canada, uh, Discovery Channel Canada. They did a show about Hurricane Matthew that we shot uh, some segments for back in 2017, and it's airing on Discovery Channel Canada. If I can say, I've tried to say Discovery Channel, 
Discovery Canada in a few days. And I'm going to go up there and help them promote that. So I'm flying out to Toronto on Wednesday. And um, so I can't be in Oklahoma today and then get stuck or whatever. It's just the way it goes, bad timing. But anyway, I wanted to talk about that. As part of their Rogue Earth uh, series that they have, and this one's about Hurricane Matthew, and I have uh, previewed it, and uh, they do a remarkable job, that is for sure, and I'm very excited about visiting Canada for the first time, and uh, I'll be up there Wednesday and be back on Friday. Now, also, coming up, Tracking the Hurricanes 2018. A lot of people asking me about this, and it is without a doubt the best documentary I have ever put together on a number of levels. I have talked about it and talked about it, and as they say, it, it, well, they say, you know, the hype is real, and I will add to that, in my opinion, yes, the hype is real. Um, you aren't prepared for how good this is. Just the overall story, the background information, the music is exceptional. I do the music myself and uh, using synthesizers, and I mean, I literally compose it. I don't just put musical elements together in some computer program. I get the keyboard. Here's one of them right here. This is called a keyboard controller, and I hook this up, uh, pair it with my uh, iPad, and it's got these great synthesizer pads and sounds, and I actually play the, the notes and make it up out of thin air. And I have other keyboards over there to my right. You can just see the edge of one. Those are all from the 80s and 90s, believe it or not, but um, there was no Bluetooth back then. Um, and anyway, I do the music, you know, the writing's really good. I watch it and I think, wow, you did this. You know, pretty good. So I'm very excited about it. It is going to debut on the big screen here in Wilmington, North Carolina on May 30th. I'm 95% sure it's going to happen. I'm just waiting for a couple of things to be shored up and confirmed, and then I'll be able to really promote it big time. Uh, but May 30th, Thursday, May 30th, here in Wilmington at Regal Cinemas. I'll talk about it in detail when it's 100% confirmed, which hopefully will be today. And then we're wanting to show it in Tallahassee, Florida, sometime in mid-June. All right, so that's very exciting. Also, on uh, May 30th, when I show it at the theater, uh, I will literally activate the online version of it at Amazon Video that evening. So you'll be able to purchase this or rent it on Amazon Video and eventually I'll put it on Vimeo as well. But Amazon, everybody knows what Amazon is. People have asked, are you going to put it on YouTube? Well, the short answer is no, because there's no way for me to rent it or sell it to people. And before you get all upset, well, I thought you were going to give it away for free. Well, do you work for free? Uh, I certainly can't, and uh, I think this could really help with funding the future. It's not going to help fund me, uh, you know, a trip to the Bahamas or something. That's not why I do this. I do this as my job, but this is so good that I think it might be a big ticket to helping to fund future work. And you want me to keep doing this, right? So it's my responsibility to raise the capital to do so. And when you have an amazing product like this documentary, um, you need to monetize it. And at least with it being available online, as opposed to a DVD, DVDs could be 25 30 bucks, and I have to ship them. And, I mean, DVDs, I mean, come on, who plays DVDs anymore? The online version can be in beautiful high definition, and it's much more economical than a DVD. So I'm doing the best that I can with that, and I think global distribution is important, and I've got that, well, at least Germany, Japan, U.S., and um, England, U.K. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the world. We'll see. So that's coming up uh, May 30th. This will be available to everybody. I'll talk about it a lot more as we get closer. I'm going to be producing some featurettes, and I'll probably put the final trailer out for this on Wednesday of this week as well. All right, also real quick, on Patreon, I'm going to be talking about this more and more. I realized the other day, this is more than just, you know, sign up, give me money, and I do stuff for you. It's not that at all. This is literally a way for me to engage with those who are able to support our project in a way that's very similar to WordPress or blogging. 
So it's not just a subscription, right? It's it's like I couldn't. I was like, oh, of course, that is the way to look at this. Obviously, I mean, I've known this for about a year, but it really dawned on me the other day that when I do these posts, that it's very much like doing a, a WordPress post. Um, it's wanting me to unlock this because I'm all watching this not logged in. See that over there? So members get access to this, obviously. But, uh, yeah, anywhere I am, either with my iPhone or an iPad or whatever, I can post videos, I can post GIF animations, um, whatever the case may be. And, uh, wow, this is really, really going to be something. And I'm going to be adding some features to it as we go forward. Very, very excited about this. And I'm going to tell you what. If everybody that subscribed to my YouTube channel just did that $1 a month, which is 12 bucks a year, are you kidding me? You know what we could do with that. I know anybody can, oh, if we only had a dollar for everybody that, it's, it's true. Even half the people, that kind of a monthly revenue stream to fund this work would change everything. And we're working on it. And we've got 122 uh, patrons right now. And that number is growing. It's fantastic. I look forward to doing more. So if you're wanting to join up, even for a dollar a month, you bet it is going to be incredible, especially as it grows over time. I'll say one more thing. I'm going to bring me back up because this is important. About the Patreon, this will be the only thing that you subscribe to. Yeah, you got Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, Prime, etc. Find me something else that eventually will get cheaper with time. Because as I hit certain milestones, I'm going to go in and say, all right, everybody, at such and such a level, I need you to reduce your level by $5. Because we've got enough on the lower end, if you will, and that's just lower end meaning a lower cost structure. You know, the more people we have, the cheaper it's going to become. Find some other business model. Netflix just keeps going up. The more people they've got, the higher that price goes. I know because they just increased it on me. Yeah, they produce great content, and I'm not Netflix, not yet. But, hey, as far as Hurricane Immersive Live Video goes, I'll put my stuff up against Netflix any day of the week. <laughs> it's just trying to be funny there. All right, finally, this was a suggestion from one of our patrons. His name was Brent. He said, hey, Mark, you got all this stuff that you need for the season, and people are always asking you, uh, how can I help? Well, Amazon lets you create a wish list. Uh, I thought I knew that, but I guess I didn't. So I created one, and it's got a list of all the stuff that we need, from the cases that our cameras go in to the batteries that power them to the uh, sealant that we use to seal everything, the all-important chips, uh, the memory chips, these brand new Kestrels that we're going to in, uh, introduce for pressure, and the actual cameras themselves. These are the top things that we could use for this year. So, if you're in the position to buy one of these, it'll ship it to me. And if you want to, I'll tell everybody that you did it. You just let me know. I'm going to put a link to this. I mean, if you want to write all that down up there, go right ahead. But I'm going to put a link to this in the description of today's video, and I'll talk about this often. And if you want to contribute, uh, we would like to get uh, 12 more Nest Cams as an example, so we have 20 total. Can you imagine 20 live cams, something like Michael in the future? You bet. We want to get about 10 of these uh, Kestrels. We need 10 more memory cards, so forth and so on. Uh, any one of these, you know, people saying, hey, I'm going to get you a memory card. Or somebody says, I'm going to get you a, a 50 amp hour uh, battery pack. That's going to be extremely helpful. And I thank you in advance. So be sure to check out the description of the video and you'll see the link directly to it in there. All right. Covered a lot today. A lot going on. It's almost hurricane season. Um, Big high risk day on the plains. Man, there's just a lot going on with the weather, that is for sure. And my wife, uh, busy as well, traveling this week. Next week's the premiere of the video, the movie at the theater. Wow, got to pinch myself, make sure it's all real. But it is, and I'm enjoying every minute, minute of it. I appreciate everybody on your side of the screen watching, being a part of it. You know, even if you're not in the position to uh, contribute financially, just watching the video and commenting on it, I hardly get any negative comments, and I know I'm probably going to get some now because people love 
When you bait them like that, I don't care. Uh, it's true. And that kind of support, the people that comment, and, and how intelligent people are as well with their comments to each other. They're not only kind to me, but I see very little people of people putting each other down in the comments. So your interactivity is what's so important as well. The money is what makes the world go around, absolutely. But just you watching from your side uh, of the screen makes it all worthwhile. It really does. Because without you, there's no reason for me to sit here in this office and talk like this for more than 30 minutes. All right? Of course. You guys have a great rest of your week ahead. If you happen to be watching in the Great Plains, oh, please be careful. Be aware. This is your Michael coming, as you know. That's the best analogy I can put to that. We'll hope for the best for you. All right, MarkSouthHurricaneTrack.com. I'm going to try to put something together. In fact, I will tomorrow. But then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'll be traveling. Might take my laptop. We'll see. Um, put something together as the week progresses. Keep an eye on 90L, so forth and so on. Until then, have a great rest of your Monday. We'll talk again soon.